What's cracking, big dogs? My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. Yes, I am wearing a hat. I realize that I never wear a hat. I just felt like fucking wearing a hat today. I also don't film on Saturdays typically, but we're filming on a Saturday. It's a new era. It's a new dawn for Big Dogs Gotta Eat. We're being bold today. Maybe that's why I wore the hat. I didn't even realize it because we're doing bold predictions for 2020 fantasy football. We're going to split it up into two separate videos. We're going to do one for the AFC. We're going to do one for the NFC, and I'm going to make one bold prediction for each division within the conference. Before we do so, I want to hit you with a, an absolutely jaw-dropping life hack that I discovered this weekend if you're moving into a new apartment or if you just want to spice up your house do it yourself diy decoration life hack you ready i've actually like never been so proud of something i've done before take the top of a pineapple once you cut the pineapple you cut it up no seeds no pits no nothing put it into a candle that you're done with we all know we need plants in our house. If you're like me, I have no idea what kind of plants to buy. I'm not actually going to go out of my way to buy a fucking plant and make my apartment look nice, but I know I should have them when girls come over like, oh, this is so fucking nice of you. Now you could put up a fraud plant and make it look cool. This is how you swag out your apartment or your house. Greatest life hack you'll hear on a YouTube channel. This blew your mind. Hit that thumbs up button. I'm ready to roll. Tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. And let's eat. We're gonna start it off. I'm actually gonna roll the sleeves up a little bit. That's how you know we're getting serious. We're gonna roll the sleeves up. We're gonna start with the AFC East. Also, I wanna hear some of y'all's bold predictions for this year. 2020 fantasy football. Don't hit me with them lazy ass takes. There's nothing worse than lazy ass bold predictions for fantasy football. Oh, this guy's gonna be a top five running back. Like why though? I'd rather you have not even opened your mouth and said some lazy shit like that. So drop some of your bold predictions down below. Give me at least like one sentence, one big fact behind your statement, okay? We're gonna kick things off with the AFC East. My bold prediction for the AFC East in 2020 fantasy football, Sony Michelle is the highest scoring fantasy running back in the AFC East. I know I've got a lot of explaining to do. Not only do I need to petition for Sony Michelle, but I need to bring down all the other backs in the division. We could start in Buffalo where they have Devin Singletary and Zach Moss, two guys that I even like as players. And I think a lot of people like in fantasy. However, I think they're going to start to cannibalize each other. Devin Singletary will get 10 to 12 carries a game, maybe. I think he'll get some of the passing work, but the more I read into like Josh Allen dumping it off, I believe it was, maybe it was Rich Rebar, maybe it was someone from Roto World came out with a stat from last year that said Josh Allen dumped the ball off to his running backs on 6% of his attempts. He is a running quarterback. He's a mobile quarterback. He does not use the running backs much in the passing game. And Zach Moss being there pretty much eliminates any upside that Devin Singletary has in the touchdown department, as is Josh Allen, Josh Allen being a running quarterback. So Devin Singletary is not going to score a lot of rushing touchdowns. He's not going to catch that many passes. He's going to get decent enough volume, but so is Zach Moss. Zach Moss is going to come in, get that Frank Gore roll, get 10 to 12 carries on the game. So I think they both end up cannibalizing each other. I think both of them could finish around like 900 total yards from scrimmage, four, five, six touchdowns. That ain't going to be enough to outscore my man, Sony Michelle. Here's why I say this about Sony. I think the more I think about this, if you're following me on Twitter, you've probably seen me type this with my Twitter fingers before. I think that Bill has been smart. The, the Cam Newton signing is everything, right? That's the reason why I put them up here. I think Bill's been super smart making that signing. And I think he's been watching the Baltimore Ravens very closely. And I think we're going to see, obviously, yes, I know before you guys all comment below about how Josh McDaniels is at OC, he had Tim Tebow there in 2012 or whatever it is. Guess what? Wills McGahee coming off of like four terrible years balled out in that one year under Tim Tebow. So what happens with mobile quarterbacks? They open up the lanes for you. I think we're going to see something closer to the Baltimore Ravens attack last year letting cam kind of run free than we are them trying to force him into their system so i think we're going to see something of a baltimore ravens light offense in new england this year yes i get it they're not as good as baltimore they're not going to be as good they don't have last year's fucking mvp but what i think this means is sony michelle might be this year's mark ingram he doesn't have a lot of passing game upside he only averaged like 13 and a half carries last year but he scored a shit ton of touchdowns even the target numbers that mark ingram had last year he caught like 26 passes sony michelle can get up to those numbers 
numbers, no problem. But the touchdowns is what comes back into play. I think with Cam, they'll obviously be a pretty good offense. They had a lot of their offensive line banged up last year, which put Brady under pressure all the time. But with Sonny Michel playing that Mark Ingram role, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities for him to flirt with nine or 10 rushing touchdowns this year. And again, going back to that Josh McDaniels offense, I have some stats written down from 2011 when Tim Tebow was the quarterback there. You know, so you're comparing Tim Tebow to Cam Newton and running similar offenses. If you look at the RB there, you had a 29 or 30 year old Willis McGahee. He ran for 1,200 yards following the three years prior to that 1,200 yard season behind Tim Tebow with fewer than 700 rushing yards. So three straight years of fewer than 700 rushing yards, runs under Tim Tebow and Josh McDaniels, pops off for 1,200 yards. He averaged 4.8 yards per carry that year, which was just the second time in his entire nine-year career that he had averaged over 4.1 yards per carry. I think this opens up a lot for Sony. And the biggest part here, of course, is health. He had a procedure on his foot, but the reports are dating back to almost three or four weeks now saying that he's, he was out of a walking boot and he is into rehab like a a month in it was more procedural it wasn't like a certain thing that kind of popped off and now he's dealing with a new injury this is something that he's probably gonna have to maintain but listen he got a lot of work last year I think he continues to get more work going into 2020 and operates as the guy that they drafted him to be in the first round James White's obviously gonna get his Damian Harris I mean he literally did nothing last year so the hype on Damian Harris is kind of out of control given that they've shown nothing of him being part of the game plan and then lastly of course we have to touch on Breida Le'Veon I just think I mean Breida's a very exciting running back to me I think he's extremely underrated Jordan Howard is basically like Sony Michelle but in an offense that's going to score a touchdown and a half fewer per game so I don't see his touchdown ceiling being very high because they're not going to have a lot of passing opportunities Matt Breida he's not going to get that much volume he's going to need to make extremely explosive plays weekly and I don't think we want to depend on that Le'Veon Bell I just think this is going to be such a poor year for Le'Veon Bell in the beginning of the summer I was or the beginning of the offseason I was much higher on Le'Veon just because you knew what you were going to get consistency week over week but everything we've heard out of New York has been negative for Le'Veon Bell and his fantasy outlook and and just the overall scheme of like what's going on like yes they upgraded their offensive line this is still going to be a bad offense this is still going to be a bad offensive line this is still under a terrible head coach who's going to have a scheme that barely works it's going to be another rebuilding brutal year for gangrene the only thing that Bell had working for him last year was the volume and we've already heard multiple times this offseason that they are going to pull back on the volume and lighten his workload Adam Gaze never wanted him there from the start they bring in Frank Gore the god they bring in they draft Michael P Ryan who I think is absolutely terrible but I didn't say they're lightening his workload and turning it into something good this is what NFL coaches do if they want to lighten the workload they'll just do it regardless of how efficient the other person's touches are and this is Adam Gase we're talking about so I think things are going to get ugly for Le'Veon Bell real quick so just by process of elimination Le'Veon Bell I, I, the only thing he had going for him was volume I think we see that peeled back next year the Dolphins offense just won't score enough to get either Breda or Jordan Howard high enough in the touchdown department to get him get them at their ceiling I think between Devin Singletary and Zach Moss they're kind of similar to the Dolphins situation where they're going to cannibalize each other to the point where neither of them hit a ceiling which leaves Sony Michelle out here LeGarrette Blunt, fucking 2015 season incoming let's move over to the AFC West I'm all in on Derek Carr I'm not really all in he's like my quarterback 22 or some shit here's what we're going to say Derek Carr finishes the season as a top five passer in the NFL Top five in passing yards. Derek Carr has been given an unfair shtick over here. He has been relatively good relative to... I need to get better on podcasting. I need to be a better podcaster and stop using shit like that relative to relativity. To what they've given him. To what Oakland's given Derek Carr to work with. He has put up statistics that I think are impressive. This will be the best group of weapons that he's had to work with, I think, pretty much since he's been in the NFL. Maybe he's had a little bit more talent on the roster before, but the way that, that Gruden's going to be able to utilize these guys, I think will ultimately be the reason why these weapons are the best that he's worked with. Henry Ruggs, Darren Waller, Brian Edwards, Hunter Renfro, Josh Jacobs, Tyrell Williams. They've got a really good slew of guys there and a really good underrated passing attack, I think, incoming. Last year, Carr set career highs in both completion percentage, 70.4%. Drew Brees was the only quarterback in the NFL that had a higher completion rate last year, as well as adjusted completion rate, which accounts for things like throwaways, spikes, or whatever. Carr completed 82.3% of his throws last year when you adjust for all those throwaways and shit. His average depth of throw, very low. Obviously, I know that. But he also set a career high in passing yardage, despite having a career low 
in passing attempts. So something's got to give. He was extremely efficient, extremely accurate last year. Now, Henry Ruggs is a player that adds an element to this offense that will keep things going north, right? Even if that A dot is low, Henry Ruggs is a guy who can make explosive plays down the field, which will increase that passing yardage. There's a lot of playmakers on this offense now that make plays after the catch and Renfro and Darren Waller. Those guys are explosive players with the ball in their hands. So I think despite a low average depth of target, just getting the ball in their hands will mean higher passing yardage. And most importantly for him while having those good weapons, the offensive line has been completely rebuilt and it is really good. They ranked sixth last year per football outsiders in pass blocking. And and according to playerprofiler.com, which has ratings for offensive line blocking for every player absolutely free, number one in overall pass protection rate last year. So no quarterback experienced better pass protection than Derek Carr last year. This offensive line is not to be taken lightly. Now it's Gruden's third year in the system, and he's finally building towards the offense that the personnel and the personnel that he actually wants you look at this chart and you look at the step up they took from year one with Gruden to year two and this is something that we see very 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 often in the NFL the first year in a new scheme with a new coach is relatively poor for the most part the second year we see everybody get a little bit more comfortable we see the terminology gets easier for everybody they don't have to think so much when they're on the field they're just playing the game offensive yards per game increased by almost 30 they went from 23rd rank to 12th rank passing yards went from 18th to 8th yards per play 21st to 8th yards per pass attempt 20th to 7th so you see a big increase and I think we're going to take another step up this year with more weapons third year in the system for John Gruden and this Derek Carr passing game last year he finished eighth in the league in passing yards most people don't realize that eighth in passing yards last year so I don't think top five is out of the realm whatsoever especially when you're going to have to go against these Chiefs twice a year in a division that is going to force him to throw the ball a lot Denver's going to have a much more explosive offense this year so I think Derek Carr is in for some big things man so we've got the AFC East the AFC West if y'all are enjoying this video all I ask is that y'all scroll down hit the button that looks like this if you're new to the channel one just subscribe because we're gonna be throwing out videos like this six days a week from now on six days also sorry to disappoint i know some of you guys are probably expecting q a monday but we're switching the content schedule around a little bit now that we're doing six days a week so monday tuesday will be my individual videos so an individual video like this like i've been normally doing on tuesdays thursdays there will be an additional one on monday so monday tuesday thursday my individual videos wednesday still bunk bed breakdowns friday still fade the public saturday will be q a but that q a will be available to Patreons only. They'll be allowed to be inside the Q&A while I'm live streaming. You guys will still get the content for free. So basically, if you are a Patreon, which you could sign up for on patreon.com slash BDGE every Saturday around 1 p.m. Eastern time, I will send you all a link to join the YouTube live stream. And then once we're done with it, I'll hang out with you guys for like 30, 40 minutes, ask, uh, answer as many questions as I possibly can within that time frame. And without passing away from talking at the speed that I typically talk at. After it's done, I will upload it to YouTube. So you guys will still get to watch, hopefully enjoy this Q&A videos. But if you want to actually be in there and ask your questions, your personalized questions, y'all will have to sign up on patreon.com slash BDGE. On Patreon, you'll also get access to our Discord. You'll get access to the BDGE Dynasty Leagues, Redraft Leagues. You'll get my in-season weekly rankings, all that good shit. Patreon.com slash BDGE. E. Let's talk about the AFC North. So I was looking at some numbers, and unless I'm wrong here, because I was pulling numbers from the Rotoviz game sc game screener, which is a really fun tool to fuck around with. Their numbers only go back to the year 2000, but sometimes I pull them and they give me some funky, real wonky type numbers. So I don't always know if they're 100% correct because I've been corrected on Twitter plenty of times when I put Rotoviz game screener shits, and it makes me feel like a fucking chump out here. But according to the numbers I pulled since the year 2000 possibly all time, because again, they only go back to 2000. There has never been a team with two 1,000 yard from scrimmage running backs and two 1,000 yard receivers. The Cleveland Browns will do that this year. They will be the first team to have two running backs go over 1,000 yards from scrimmage, two wide receivers go over 1,000 receiving yards. The names are pretty obvious here. Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, Nick Chubb, and Dontrell Hilliard. Kareem Hunt, of course. So Odell topped it last year. Landry topped it last year. Chubb smashed it. I can't believe, man, maybe I need to rethink my 
point of view on Chubb. This dude is the most untalked about 1,772 yard from scrimmage season of all time. That's ridiculous. So Odell went for 1035. Landry went for 1174. Chubb went for 1772. Hunt only played in eight games. His yardage only paces out to 928 total yards. But I think this is a year in which he's coming in fresh, starting off fresh. You have Kevin Stefanski coming in who is going to utilize the shit out of both of these backs, both Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb. They upgraded their offensive line pretty tremendously, so the efficiency is only going to go up from there. Last year, they used a ton of play action, which is going to make their passing game more efficient. It's going to make their running game more efficient. I really like this hire for, for Cleveland. The offensive line, it's going to be bigger holes. It's going to be more time for Baker to throw the ball downfield to Odell Beckham. And just let Jarvis Landry do whatever the fuck he does. He goes over a thousand yards like every single year, pretty much. The only worry here is the health of both wide receivers. Jarvis is tough, man. That hard knock scene from a couple years ago, everybody shit on him for. I forget what the fuck he said, but it was cringy at the time. The dude's played in 96 of a possible 96 games since entering the league. So everyone else could pretty much shut their mouths and get their asses on the field. But he's coming off a serious hip surgery, which is what concerns me. But until he shows otherwise, until he shows that he can't play through it, I mean, I'm, I'm not about to knock him for that because he's, again, 96 of 96. Pretty damn impressive. Odell is finally also coming off of a 16-game season for the first time since 2016. And while I think he's probably overrated as the, the top elite talent-wide receiver that we wanted him to eventually become in his career, he was definitely hurt last year. And I talked about this in one of the recent videos. Uh, I listened to a podcast podcast that Matt Harmon the guy who does reception perception he charts all the receivers and their percentage of success against man coverage press coverage zone coverage or whatever said that Odell was almost certainly hurt last year because the number in terms of his success rate in all of the previous years were like in the 99th percentile against man coverage and press coverage and all that it dipped down tremendously last year he said he's never seen a dip off like that in a player and he he thinks that the sports hernia was what really killed him last year so he still went over a thousand yards so there's no reason he shouldn't be able to do it this year 2018 he blew up for over a thousand yards in just 12 games so so this is going to be a funnel offense, in my opinion, to OBJ, to Landry in the passing game, and then to Chubb and Hunt coming out of the backfield. They bring in Hooper. I don't think he's going to be a heavily targeted guy. I think he's going to be more of like a red zone guy. I don't think they have a big body type receiver there to, to catch balls, or at least that they feel comfortable throwing to. Obviously, Njoku's big, but the other guys, Odell, Jarvis, are fucking snack-sized over there, right? So Hooper brings that kind of presence to the offense. So I think I think my bold prediction has nothing fucking do with touchdowns. So don't worry about Austin Hooper. 1,000 yards. All the boys is eating in Cleveland. Let's move to the last one, and that is the AFC South. Here's what we're going to say. I love this one. I love this one a lot. This is easily the boldest take. Derrick Henry will finish with more total yards. Total yards from scrimmage. Pass, uh, receiving. Yeah, fuck it. We'll throw passing in there. Maybe they fuck around and let him chuck up a, a couple of the bombs. Passing, rushing, receiving yards. Total yards from scrimmage. Then the other three teams in their divisions, starting running backs have rushing yards. So Derrick Henry's total yards, greater sign. The other three starters, rushing yards. Let that sink in for a second. We look at Indianapolis. They are sharing carries between Marlon Mack, Jonathan Taylor, Naeem Hines. No matter how bad you want Jonathan Taylor to get his 350 carries, they've said nothing all offseason except that this will be very much a committee. Maybe Jonathan Taylor takes over like week nine or week 10 or something, I think it's going to be committee for most of the season. You look at Jacksonville, I just have very, very little confidence in Leonard Fournette. I think he's a shitty, shitty, shitty runner. The only man in the history of the NFL that could pull off a 69-yard run in a game and finish the game with 66 rushing yards. Really fucking impressive. Probably the most impressive thing he did all of last year. Houston Texans, David Johnson. I don't even know if I'd consider him a running back at this point anymore. He might be less impressive running inside and running in between tackles and Leonard Fournette at this point. So we look at the actual numbers here, right? You don't want to just hear me spit fucking stupid shit about David Johnson, Leonard Fournette. Derrick Henry's numbers last year, when Ryan Tannehill was the starter, courtesy of one Rotoviz game screener. This is also a tweet directly from Curtis Patrick, who is part of Rotoviz. A uh, great follow on Twitter at C Patrick NFL. If you look at the numbers, rushing yards and receiving yards in games where Ryan Tannehill was the starter. That's 136 total yards per game, 2,183 total yards on the season. This does not, I repeat for y'all on the bike, this does not include the bike-to-bike -bike 200 plus yard games he had in the playoffs. If you include that, which makes this an incredibly hefty sample size, you're looking at 141.3 total yards per game, 2260 on the year. As I said, Derrick Henry's total yardage, 2260, will outpace 
the other three running backs rushing yardage. I'm not including their passing yardage. I think Taylor and Mack, I think they cannibalize each other for the rushing yardage. Right now, DraftKings Sportsbook has the over-under for both of those guys, Mack and Taylor, set at 700 rushing yards. So I'm not fucking crazy. Leonard Fournette is only set at 850 rushing yards. I'm not fucking crazy. David Johnson isn't listed, but JFC, I ain't gonna say it out there for you spiritual religious people, this guy is really bad at the only thing Bill O'Brien wants to do, shove the ball up the middle with his running backs on first and second downs. Over his tenure, there has been no head coach that runs the ball up the middle on a higher percentage of their plays on first and second down, and David Johnson is the David Johnson of doing that. If he's going to be fantasy relevant this year, it's because they get him involved in the passing game. But my prediction has nothing to do with the passing game when it comes to these three guys. So again, Derrick Henry, total yards. He is the favorite in Vegas right now to lead the league in rushing yards. After that extension, you know that boy is going to fucking eat like it's Thanksgiving. And that will wrap up the bold prediction video. Tomorrow's video will be the NFC edition. If y'all thought the big facts in today's videos were good, Make sure you cop the draft guide. It is live right now. The easiest way for y'all to do that. For $10, you can get the three different draft guides we have available right now. Plus $25 to play with on Monkey Knife Fight. The best player prop game site out there. Once the NFL season kicks off, we will be diversifying the revenue on there. We will be winning you the mortgage on monkeyknifefight.com once the NFL season starts. But you can get a head start right now by depositing $10 on monkeyknifefight.com using the promo code BDG. E, when you deposit that, which will get you $25 to play with on the site. So they're giving you a free 15 on top of it. And you will get access to the season long draft guide that we got at Big Dogs with all these fucking big facts in it. The rookie dynasty kit, which is going to prepare you for your startup draft. And if you just want to know about the rookies, this is included for free. So fuck it. Why not? Right. Plus, Dr. Morse's full injury guide. Anyone that's relevant to an injury coming into this year, he's got ratings, he's got video profiles, he's got full written profiles on them. Literally the best piece of product you could possibly get in the fantasy football world right now. MonkeyKnifeFight.com, promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks. Play a game on there of $2, and I will email you access within 24 hours of playing the game. That's all I got for y'all today. Hit that thumbs up. Become a Patreon. Patreon.com slash BDGE. Subscribe to the channel. If you are nuevo, I think that's how you say no. I'm, I'm just stop talking now. Love you. Bye.